Good morning. Praise God that everything started and video is recording on the first try this morning. I'll give you just a few minutes uh, to join us here on Facebook and on Instagram. Hope you're having a blessed morning. There we go. Good morning, Vicki. And Steve, of course. I'll remind you all as you uh, begin to join us, you can share this video live, you can share it uh, later on after the fact, um, and make sure you're sharing uh, our Sunday sermons and Wednesday uh, devotionals and Bible studies and all of our other videos as you feel, you know, maybe a specific message or specific text you think will speak um, to somebody specifically, so you can share it. Uh, we'll have Sunday's Sunday's sermon is already on Facebook, um, but we'll have it up on uh, YouTube uh, later today as well, as along with uh, this video and all of our uh, devotions and Bible studies and prayer meetings and times together as well. Again, as you join us, uh, we'll be in Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 45 today. Um, <clears throat> kind of a shorter text. But we're going to, uh, I believe God has a word for us uh, in this text as well. Just in case you join us and you do not know who I am, uh, you just happen to find us. My name is Robbie Ridgeway. I'm the pastor at Amelia Baptist Church in Beaumont, Texas. And uh, for the last week and into this week, as we prepare for Easter Sunday, we've been walking through uh, Luke's gospel with a couple of steps into the Psalms. Uh, but primarily in Luke's gospel, uh, just looking at how we are to live in light of the resurrection. So as you join us, please turn to Luke 19, starting in verse 45 this morning. Um, and do share the video and let folks know where we're here and uh, that we are, uh, we are still together, even if we can't physically be together. You'll notice I'm, I am at the church today. I had to take care of a couple of things that I uh, had to do here. So I'm here this morning, uh, but I am primarily working from home, as you all know. So in Luke 19, uh, starting in verse 45 is where I'll read. This, this happens, uh, it's, it's in Luke's gospel uh, almost immediately after Jesus comes into Jerusalem of the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. And I, I most, most people agree this is chronologically as well, something that takes place almost immediately, if not as he's coming in to Jerusalem. So we read in verse 45 of chapter 19 in Luke's gospel. He, Jesus, went into the temple and began to throw out those who were selling. And he said, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Every day he was teaching in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the leaders of the people were looking for a way to kill him, but they could not find a way to do it because all the people were captivated by what he had to say. Uh, so this might be a passage that you've wondered about. I, I remember as a child wondering, if Jesus wants us to love people and turn the other cheek and be meek, how in the world can he come into the temple throwing tables and uh, I believe it's Matthew's gospel actually describes him making a whip uh, to drive the money changers out. And there's, there's some questions. I think even on a deeper level, we miss uh, what Luke is telling us and what Jesus is teaching us in his statement. So I'm going to describe a little bit uh, what life in the first century in the temple in Jerusalem would have been like. Uh, the reason there are money changers there is because uh, some people who were coming from a long distance... Um, might not be able to bring all their sacrifice, so they would bring money in instead of a sacrifice, and they would have to buy the sacrifice when they got to the temple. So those people are paying and switching out to receive uh, the right kind of offering, whether it's a lamb or a dove or a grain offering or whatever it may be. The other reason is there were specific coins that the Jewish people would use in the temple, so they would not bring the Roman coins that have Caesar's face on it because that would be an abomination to God. So they were coming to either buy the proper sacrifice that they could not bring long distances or to switch their, their money into the proper coinage they could use for the temple tax and to support um, God's ministry and God's Levites and priests 
in the temple. So that's why there are money changers. It's, it's, it's not a bad reason in and of itself to have this, this practice done uh, in the temple. But there's some deeper realities in the words that Jesus uses that if we don't look to the Old Testament text that Jesus is quoting, we miss the detail of his condemnation. He is not simply condemning um, the people because they're changing money and they're doing something beyond praying. He's condemning them for that, yes, but also as a sign of a deeper problem. So first we read uh, in verse 46 here, it was writ- it is written, Jesus says, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer. So your Bible might have a footnote that tells you that is quoted from Isaiah 56, 7. So I'm going to turn there quickly and, and read Isaiah 56, 7. We read, I will bring them to my holy mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. So Jesus here is quoting a passage from the prophet Isaiah, uh, which, which is actually describing God's temple as a place where not just Jewish people, but all people can come to worship God. Now this is looking forward to um, uh, Jesus return and the culmination and the the reality of all that Jesus brings in all of God's kingdom and and when we will all come together we have come together as one people under Christ but it's looking forward to that eschatological hope but it's also pointing to God's expectation here on earth that we are one people and the Jewish people are here us uh, stopping now let me tell you how they're stopping the uh, the Gentiles from worshiping God in the temple, we, we can't go into all the details of the temple, but uh, the temple had three levels where people could go to. We know at the center, the holiest of holies, only the high priest went in there once a year. Immediately outside of the holy of holies was the court of, of, of Jews, and that's where the Jewish men could go to pray. And then beyond that was the court of women, which was where Jewish women can go to pray. And then beyond that was the, the court of the Gentiles. The only place where Gentiles, non-Jewish people, could go into the temple was into the court of the Gentiles. And we know that this is where the money changers would set up. So Jesus is not just condemning the people for changing money. He's condemning them for for ignoring those who are not Jewish, for ignoring the Gentiles, for ignoring those people who need the good news of Jesus Christ. They are showing even greater contempt for non-Jewish people by putting the money changers in their court so that they can't worship, they can't pray, they can't focus on God. They have this, this interaction and this hustle and bustle of everybody else that's causing a problem. So Jesus is addressing that reality that the Jewish people have lost sight of the kingdom of God and who the kingdom of God is supposed to be, which we know is not just Jewish people. It's all people who come to God in faith through Jesus Christ. We come to another passage. The rest of Jesus' statement is quoting another Old Testament passage. But you have made it a den of thieves. And this is quoting, you may also see from Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11. Let me read that to you. Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers in your view? Yes, I have seen it, and this is the Lord's declaration. Now, if we read uh, the beginnings of chapter 7 and this section in the prophet Jeremiah, we see that God is actually condemning his people for for a... Uh, 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 improper worship in the temple. See, the Jewish people had gotten to a point where they had basically said, well, we're Jews, we go to the temple, that means we're good before God. We don't have, it doesn't matter uh, anything else, the fact that we are Jews and we have the temple means that God loves us. And, and, And Jeremiah, a God through Jeremiah is condemning them saying, no, no, you have to show love to me. You have to show obedience to me. You have to come to me in the way that I have called you to come into me. So Jesus is also contem- condemning the Jewish people in the first century in Jerusalem, in the temple, condemning them for not only building, building obstacles for non-Jewish people to come and worship God, not only ignoring the needs of the Gentile people, but also losing sight of what it truly is to follow and to love God. Yes, Jesus is heartbroken, I believe, by seeing this money, these interactions, and this people making money instead of praying. But his choice of quoting two Old Testament passages shows us, and any good Jewish uh, 
man or woman at this time would recognize these passages. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the prophets, especially the Pharisees and the religious leaders that were, that were seeking to harm Jesus. They knew exactly what Jesus was trying to tell them. Jesus is saying, your temple is broken. Your worship is broken because you have neglected those who are not already a part of my people. You've neglected the outsider for the sake of being selfish and focusing only on yourself. You have even neglected proper worship for me because you think that just because you come to God's house means that you're good with God. Now, I hope you can see some of the implications for us in our churches and our life today. We cannot be focused so much on ourselves that we ignore the people around us. We cannot be so focused on simply going to a physical, <coughs> excuse me, a physical building or a physical sanctuary thinking that that makes us okay with God. I don't know how many people have said to me, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good with God. I go to church most of the time. No, going to church is not what makes you right with God. It's coming to God in the way that he says, through faith in Jesus Christ, through grace that forgives us, and living a life that's sacrificial, that's humble, that's focused on God and focused on others, loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and loving our neighbor as ourself. Jesus is condemning the religious people of his day, the Jewish people who were listening, because they neglected the outsider and they neglected proper worship of God. Now, I believe we're guilty of this in some ways, but I also want us to think for a moment. You see, this pandemic is going to provide a lot of difficulties, a lot of struggles today and in the long term. But it also provides new opportunities. One of these opportunities is that we get to come to people over Facebook and Instagram and, and, and over other forms of social media and, and, and the internet. But it also provides us, you see, this is a time when we can take deep um, uh, introspection of, of our priorities. We can look at who we are and say, hmm, I wonder if we're doing things the way we should. I wonder if there's anything that we should change because the reality is we have an opportunity to, in some ways, start fresh in the way that we, that we uh, express uh, ourselves, the way that we understand God, the way that we show love to others, the way that we focus our hearts, minds, and souls on God. We can't focus on God by coming into the church right now. We have to do it at home in our hearts and in our souls and as we focus on Him. We can't show, we can't ignore people in the same way we would even though we might be tempted. God's called us to love Him and to love others. I hope that we're not guilty of these same sins that, that the Jewish people were of neglecting the others around us, other people around us, and neglecting God in our worship. But what better time for us to take stock of our lives individually and as a church? What better opportunity for us to take a chance to say, am I truly living the way God wants me to? Am I truly following him the way he wants me to? Am I truly showing love the way that he has called me to? I pray that you might ask yourselves that questions, that we as churches might ask ourselves those questions, and that we as the broader body of Christ might ask those questions. Father God, we come before you today, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus Christ coming to Jerusalem for the purpose of paying the penalty of our sin on the cross. Father, I pray that we would seek to live in light of his sacrifice and his resurrection from the dead and defeating of sin. We would seek to live a life that represents that. Father, I pray specifically in light of this text that we've read that we would live in such a way that we show love to those outside of our body, the body of Christ, that we would show love to the people that others hate, that we would show love to those that have been forgotten and neglected. And Father God, that we would come to you in the way that you have called us, not just claiming, well, I go to church. My parents were Christians. I was baptized as a child. No, that we would come to you with humble hearts, seeking to serve you in the way that you have called us to serve, that we would bring worship that's pleasing and honoring to you and not to our own preferences. Father, I pray that during this coronavirus, this pandemic, we would take the opportunity to cut out these things in our lives that are sick and diseased and sinful and grow closer to you, that we would take this opportunity in our churches to, when we, when we come back, to start fresh and do the things right that we have done wrong, maybe for years, that we would have discernment to see or we are missing your mark or missing your standard as fellowshipping as the body of Christ. 
Father, I continue to pray that you would be at work in the midst of this pandemic. God, that you would not bring us back as normal, but you would bring us back grow as grown and maturing Christians. That you would give us insight into the new way of life and new opportunities of ministry and service. Father, I pray for your hand of protection and blessing on all those who are serving in the midst of this pandemic, for the doctors and nurses, for the teachers who are working online, for, for grocery store employees, for first responders, for all those who, who are working and putting themselves in difficult ways or facing new challenges as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Father, I pray for those who have lost loved ones to this virus already, that you would bring peace and comfort as only you can. And Father, for those who are infected, that you would bring healing to them. Father, miraculous healing, that you would bring an end to this virus as a whole, completely in this world, Father. Father, reveal to us our role to play as your people in the midst of this time. We love you, God, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I thank you for joining us today. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, at the same time at 11 o'clock uh, and we'll be continuing through God's word during this holy week. Make sure you share this. Make sure you check us, check out our website, ameliabaptistchurch.org and uh, make sure that you share our Easter Sunday event on Facebook. Invite your friends to join us on Facebook, on Instagram um, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I love you. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.